One year ago, the ministers of the Florida district elected a new superintendent. He stepped into this role, the role of our bishop with grace and dignity. He is apostolic. He's a man of character and integrity, faithful and compassionate, a true leader with a vision for the future, our future. He accepted the mantle to lead and was immediately thrust into one of the most difficult years that we can remember in our history. But he with grace and leadership has guided us through. It is evident that God's hand is upon his life. He has the blessing of the body and he serves as our bishop. And tonight he'll step into this pulpit with a word from the Lord. Would you receive our bishop, Steve Boyd, as he comes to deliver the word of the Lord tonight. God bless you. Praise God. Can we clap our hands to the Lord? <laughs> Jesus, I feel like I need to obey the Lord tonight. I have a couple of pages of things that I felt necessary to say, but I feel a mandate to preach the word of the Lord. There's something moving in the spirit. There's something powerful here right now. Amen. Would you allow me to just break protocol and just step into the word of God? Amen. There is something tremendous that is moving in the spirit. I want to say tonight, welcome home. <laughs> I want to say welcome home. Aren't you thankful that we're back on the campground in Ocala? The spirit and the power of God has agreed to meet us here. And I appreciate your presence here. And I appreciate the presence of the Lord. If you have your Bibles in the book of Isaiah, chapter 28 and verse 16, the spirit of God is heavy. The power of God is moving and real. And I have not come tonight with a new message, nor have I come to put a new spin on an old message. But I just come under a mandate of the Holy Ghost to affirm and confirm some things in our heart. And if you will help me with the help of God, I just want to underline some things that I believe you already know and that you already hold dear. But it never hurts us to pass by them one more time. Can you say hallelujah to that? The Bible says in Isaiah 28 and 16, Therefore saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. Hallelujah. I, a tried stone, a precious stone, and a sure foundation. And from that, I want to preach to you tonight a sure foundation. What you feel under your feet tonight is a sure literal foundation. But what we feel under our spiritual man in our spiritual body is the foundation of God and the Holy Ghost. Can we clap our hands together? And magnify him one more time in this holy house. Thank you, almighty God. Thank you, almighty God. Amen. You may be seated and God bless you. A tried stone, a precious stone, and a sure foundation. Then we read those passages from, from this passage. We read those words that prick our heart and challenge our spirit. But then we read those final seven words that said, he that believeth shall not make haste. I'm thankful that we have this sure stone. I'm thankful that it is a precious stone and that it is a precious cornerstone and that it is a sure foundation. But Isaiah said those that really believe that, they're not just reading that and trying to comprehend that with their intellect, but with their spirit, they connect to that. He said, he that believeth shall not make haste, or in other words, we shall not panic, or we shall not fear. There is little question in anyone's mind that we are living in a unique hour for the church. In recent months, our lives have been indel indelibly marked with a measure of uncertainty. Local, state, 
national, and even world leaders have been wondering what our future holds. And I'm not here tonight to try to downplay the seriousness of the hour in which we all exist. But I do feel a mandate upon my heart tonight to stand in this pulpit and this evening remind all of us that God is still in control. God not one time has been scratching his head. God not one time has been folding his arms. God not one time has been perplexed. There's only one human emotion that God has never experienced, and that is the element of surprise. God has never been surprised, and therefore God has a plan. Hallelujah. I believe that mandate is upon all of us, and at the risk of sounding somewhat trite here this evening, I want to just tell you that I am thankful for the church. I'm thankful for the church of the living God, the church that the church represents everything to me. It is all I have ever known. I was born into this apostolic church. I was born into an apostolic family. I've had my hand stepped on more than one time when I was asleep under a pew when somebody came shouting by. Amen. I know what it is like to be raised in an apostolic atmosphere. I know what it is like to be raised in the home of a praying mother and a praying father. But when I talk about the church tonight, I'm not just talking about a brick and mortar building, but I'm talking about the power of anointed body, a power of an anointed body of Christ. Amen. A body that we call the church, the church of the living God. Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm in the church tonight. March 2020 introduced to us a season unlike we have ever experienced before. Our district calendar, little did we know, would be canceled altogether. And this property that we're on tonight would sit in utter silence month after month after month. The circumstances of a worldwide pandemic would close the doors of our local church, thrusting us headlong into the idea of pressing our services online. And to that end, we reach more people than we ever dreamed we would ever dare be able to do. While some in our country and some of our leaders relish the idea that our church doors had been closed, they could not and they did not close the doors of our personal prayer rooms. They did not stop the church from praying. Amen. We may not have been able to gather in a literal longitude and latitude, but I will tell you that the saints of the Most High gathered themselves interwoven in the spirit by the power of prayer we begin to pull together families gathered in their homes and prayed groups met online and prayed churches pulled together like never before and with one hand planted on earth and another hand grabbing to heaven we begin to pull that chasm together and the power and the spirit of God was released in our nation and around the world hallelujah amen in an instant we were reminded that we are not forsaken in an instant we were reminded that we were not the church anemic but we are the church triumphant we are not and we're not the church struggling and staggering trying to find and figure out what we were going to do but we found the power and the presence and the anointing of an almighty God upon us unorthodox circumstances yes unorthodox services yes but the power and the presence of God was moving in homes and people were praying through the Holy Ghost in their homes and they were receiving healing in their homes. The church had been released because we decided that we're built on a sure foundation and we will not be dissuaded otherwise. We are the church built on a foundation that can stand the test of time. Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm not a, I'm glad I'm a part of a church that's not a withering body. Amen. Groping through the darkness of uncertainty, wondering where our next meal is going to come from spiritually. Amen. I'm talking about a church victorious. I'm talking about a church built on the right foundation. I'm talking about a church that the songwriter once said, it's the old ship of Zion. It's hope for the lost and the dying. It's a soul saving station. It's the tower of salvation. It's the church 
church triumphant. Oh Lord, and it's built not by the hand of man, and it's built not by the hand of government, and it's built not by the hand of health or sickness. It is built by the hand of the Lord. Let's clap our hands. Hallelujah. God, while I cannot predict the future, there is one thing I can say with certainty. Stay in the church. This is not the time to be shopping elsewhere. This is not the time to be peering over the fence. This is not the time to be shopping. Amen. The old elder was asked if something, sir, catastrophic were to happen in this world. Do you know what you would want to do? And do you know where you would want to be? And without hesitation, the old elder reached over and picked up his Bible. And he said, I, if the world began to fall around me, what I would do is pick up this book and I would sit it on the floor and I would stand on it. Because this word said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. I want to tell you tonight, if it comes to that, we ought to set our book on the floor and say, God, I'm going to stand on your word because I know the church is not built on programs. The church is not just built on our finesse. The, birth, the church is not just built on what we can do with our own strength and power, but the church has been bought by your blood. The church has been purchased by your own life. The church is on a solid foundation. Hallelujah. I believe what the elder was trying to convey. Amen. I would ask that every God-fearing preacher and every saint of God stand with the same tenacity. In the 27th chapter of the book of Acts, we find the apostle Paul and several others in the midst of an uncertain season. In Acts chapter 27 and verse 22, he said, I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. What man made, it may not withstand. What man has designed, it may not be able to withhold against the wind and the storm. But I'm going to tell you, there's something beyond what man has made. He said, but there stood by me this night an angel of God whose I am and whom I serve. And he said, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought to Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee them all thee that all that sail with thee. I want to tell you tonight that we had the power of the Lord come alongside of us. And the Lord said, fear not. Everything is going to be all right. And pulpits all across our district and our fellowship and around the world were mounted by men and women of God that were saying to their congregations, everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. Why? Not because we've got it together, but because God has put this church on a sure foundation. Hallelujah. Paul was not preaching this message or writing this letter from the circumstance of all being well. The preceding verses tell us that the ship was caught and could not bear into the wind and that they had to undergird or strap it together. They were exceedingly tossed. They were doing everything within their power to lighten their load. The third day they cast out the tackling of the ship. They saw neither sun nor stars for many days. All hope of them being saved was quickly being lost. And so it wasn't from a lofty platform and standing behind some stained pulpit that Paul preached this message of hope but it was with salt water burning his eyes and it was with fear grabbing around his neck amen but what he was trying to say is no matter what you're feeling right now you need to stay with the ship and if I could just come to this pulpit with an old apostolic message tonight I just want to tell you this is not the time for us to drift away from our apostolic moorings this is not the time for us to drift away from hero Israel the Lord our God is one this is not the time for us to drift away from the power and the essentiality of baptism in Jesus' name. This is not the time for us to drift away from the power of the Holy Ghost feeling the lives of men and women and them speaking with other tongues as evidence that God has moved into their lives. But this is a time for the church to reach out and pull this message back into our heart just a little bit tighter. Let's hug it a little bit tighter. Let's hold it a little bit longer. Let's preach it a little bit deeper. Let's sing about it with greater passion. Let's give everything we have to the power 
in the presence of God and his word. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you help me say something tonight? When we walk through the valley low, would you say, he helped me stand? When we walk through the valley low, he helped me stand. When the night was dark, he helped me stand. When we had more questions than we had answers, he helped me stand. Hallelujah. When pastors were preaching to just a camera and maybe just a handful of media people, or it may have just been your daughter-in-law holding her camera, hallelujah, in a Sunday school room to begin with. When we were walking through an uncertain season, God helped us stand. When we were walking through a valley we had never been in before, for God helped us stand when we were doing things that we never thought we would be doing in the way we were doing it but God was with us and he helped us stand and it is a living testimony that the church was not built on the things that some think they are but it's built on the unmovable the unshakable the irrevocable word of God hallelujah Praise God. I don't want anything to stand between me and the house of God. I need you to go with me now. I was raised in a home when company came at the last minute. My parents said, well, we're glad you're here. But tomorrow is church and you're welcome to go with us. But if not, we'll be home a little afternoon. Amen. Can I get a witness in Ocala tonight? You can go with us because I can't let anything get between me and the house of God. I can't let anything get between me and the house of God. I grew up in a home when the boss man offered us a few hours overtime, said I'll be able to do that on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday, but I'm not going to be able to do that on Wednesday because I got to get to the house of God. Hallelujah. I don't want to be too old fashioned for you tonight, but I want to tell you that we got to stand on a sure foundation. What was given to us was given to us in the hands of, not in the hands of mediocrity, but it was given to us with the hands of assurance. It was given to us with care. It was given to us with caution. And let us hold fast to the profession of the saints. Let us hold fast. You see the foundation, the foundation, that's everything. That's everything. The value of a firm foundation was never made more clear to me than it was many, many years ago. My wife and I had not been married very long in the city we lived. They were building a multi-story condominium. We were, we were watching that massive condominium complex come up out of the ground. And, and it was going to be a unique situation, especially for the city that we lived in in Central Florida at that time. It was going to be very high-end condominiums and only the elite of the elite were going to be able to live there. And so as they moved in, it was headline news. It was in the newspaper very often about the, the, uh, the, progress, the progression of this, of this condominium complex. But shortly after a few tenants took occupancy, they began to realize there's something wrong, seriously wrong in the foundation. The support columns that are holding this in place. There's something severely wrong. And the end result was the tenants had to move out. And thousands of dollars were lost. And I will never forget the fateful day when hundreds of people gathered all around to watch a demolition team drop that tower back in her tracks. M millions of dollars and countless hopes and dreams were all shattered in the dust because of the one mistake that somebody made early on. I want to tell you tonight that we are built on something that can hold us when the wind starts blowing. We're built on something that can keep us when the waves start crashing. We are built on something that can keep us secure when our lives start fragmenting apart. Am I preaching to anybody tonight? Amen. We've had some days where all wasn't well. We've had some days when everything wasn't going our way, but we were able to make it and survive because we did not hook our wagon to something that may be here tomorrow and it may not be but you can cash it all in you can pour all your hopes and dreams you can stand on it because it's the church of the living God 
Hallelujah. When life comes at us fast and furious, it will matter very little what we think we're made of. When life comes at us fast and furious, it will matter very little what we hope we're made of. It will only matter what we're really made of. We must be a strong church from within. Therefore, I have to pray and you must join me. God, work on me. If I'm going to be the husband and the father and the leader that I need to be and must be, then I'm going to have to lock the door of the prayer room behind me. And I'm going to have to talk to the Lord just about me and not you and not everyone else and everything else. But I'm going to have to ask God to let the mirror of his holy word drop down and let me examine me. You see, there's an old, there's a real danger in just getting the old man dressed up and leaving that inner man vile and unclean and impure. Amen. Because if we do that, we're going to leave out the most important part. Jesus directly deals with this in Matthew 23. He said, while you have tended to some things, you have left the weightier matters. He said you may clean the outside of the cup, but inside they are full of extortion and excess. Amen. And then Jesus reared back and without any hesitation he made this admonition. He said cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter that the outside of them may be clean also. I'm thankful tonight to be a part of the apostolic church that is firmly built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And I know because I know because I know that I am standing among some apostolic men and women tonight that are apostolic from center to circumference. You were apostolic when you woke up Monday morning and you're going to be apostolic when you go to bed on Friday night. You didn't just dress up and fix up to come here and with us and worship with us tonight, but we can wake you up at two o'clock in the morning and out of a dead sleep, you can quote here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Hallelujah when your children break fever in the middle of the night. Amen. We know what it's like to walk in their room and lay our hands on their head. We don't hand them the business card of the pastor. Amen. We lay our hands on their head and say fever and sickness and infection. You got to go. You got to go because the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of the church is not locked up in a building. The power of the church is not closed when we lock the door. But the power of the church It's going to go home with us. We're built on a sure foundation. Hallelujah. If we have anything to hand to another generation, then we must pay careful attention to the foundation. It probably goes without saying at this point, you probably figured out, but I'm thankful for Acts 238. I love Acts 2.38. We set the compass of our lives by that. But I want to live Acts 2.39 as a constant reminder and mandate. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all who are far off. And so that promise begins with me. I've already quoted it many times, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. But then the Bible says in chapter 6 and verse number 6, he said, And these words I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Don't just commit this to your head. Don't just get this in your mind. But you've got to get this message in your heart. And you've got to get this message in the heart of your children. You've got to get this message in the heart of your companion. You've got to get this message in the heart of your loved ones. You've got to get it. He said, how? How then are we to go about doing that? How am I going to get this not just in my head? And how am I going to get it in my heart? He gives us the, re- the way to do that. He said, you need to talk about it when you sit down and you need to talk about it when you rise up. Hallelujah. You need to talk about it when you're walking by the way and you need to talk about it in your home. Amen. When it's raining and when the sun is shining. Hallelujah. You got to get it in your heart. We got to get it in our heart. We got to get it in our heart. We've got to get it in our heart. Hallelujah. It's imperative. It is imperative because in Acts 2.39, 
Amen. The writer here, Simon Peter, in his message mentions another group. And he said, because this message is to them who are afar off. And I want to tell you tonight, and this is not a pep rally, this is a gospel truth. There are those that have yet to walk through the doors of your church, but they are on their way. There are those of yet that have ever that have ever signed up for a Bible study, but can I tell you, they are on their way. And that's why we can't look around us on a midweek service when it's raining or cold outside and wondering if it's worth it. Yes, it's worth it. Yes, it's worth it. Amen. Because we're not just preaching for those that gathered. We're not just singing for those who came. We're not just trying to put a Bible set in together for those who walked in the door. I got to keep preaching because there's an afar off. I got to keep preaching because somebody's on their way. I got to keep preaching because somebody's on their living in their living room, sitting on their couch and God is dealing with them. Somebody, oh, Somebody passed by your church and they feel the tug and a pull. They just hadn't had the courage to pull in the parking lot yet, but keep preaching. They hadn't had the courage to drive in yet, but keep singing. Sunday school teachers keep going. Why? Because there are those that are afar off and the church has got to stand on a firm foundation. Hallelujah. So that's why we got to be intentional about the foundation. We got to be intentional because when those that are afar off walk in, they need to experience the same thing you experience. We owe them that. We owe them that. We are indebted to them for that. Amen. Now I'm going to ask the musicians to come, but that don't mean a whole lot. Amen. So don't start gathering up the children. Don't phone in your order yet. If I may speak specifically to the church right here, there are pressures that are being put on pulpits today to back away. Pressures to move away from some of the things that made us who we are. Sometimes that pressure is a little subtle. But sometimes it's not quite so subtle. But I'm standing here tonight to encourage every saint of God in this house to lift up the hands of your pastor. Hallelujah. Decide in your heart, I'm going to be an Aaron and I'm going to be a her. And I'm going to lift up the hands of my Moses. I'm going to lift them high because I know when his hands are up, we're going to win. I know when he is encouraged, we're going to win. We need pulpits that are unfettered. And we need godly men and women who will walk to that pulpit without fear and favor. Don't walk in there and figure out who's there to decide our message. Amen. We need to get our message in a prayer room. We need to get our message from God and then let God decide. I'm going to come out. I'm going to come out and preach. I'm going to preach the truth in love. I'm going to preach the truth in love. But I got a mandate on me. I got to preach the truth. I got to tell what the Lord, the word of the Lord has to say. I got to share. I got to share it. Amen. Please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say this evening, but I, I do have a great a, appreciation, even an affection for, for where the Lord has brought us. But may we never forget that some of our forefathers that preached the gospel could not even read or write, but they had a walk with God. And don't jump the ditch on me here because by no means am I promoting ignorance or illiteracy. But I'm just saying that to say this, that it wasn't their talents, it wasn't their gifts, it wasn't their abilities that set the foundation of the church. They taught, thus saith the word of God, and they just stood. And here we are in this 21st century more poised than the church has ever been. We have greater tools at our disposal. We couldn't possibly even wrap our hands or our minds around half of the things that are at our disposal, our disposal to propagate the gospel in the world in which we live. The church has never been in a greater position. And with that kind 
of responsibility placed upon our heart. I'm going to tell you that the church I'm talking about tonight was designed to stand through the storms. The wind that's blowing now, this is not the first wind the church has ever felt. It's just the first wind we ever felt. But the church has been facing things like this from the very beginning. But we just kept preaching and we just kept praying and they just kept believing and they kept spreading. And when things went wrong, the church got scattered. <laughs> Amen. And when, the, when things went wrong in the fall, in the spring of last year, the church really in truth got scattered. And the, and the gospel began to move like never before. The church was designed to stand through the storm. It was designed to be a fortress of hope to the masses. It was designed to be a lighthouse to those that were seeking direction for their lives. And if the church that I'm preaching about this evening is going to continue to the next generation, then we're going to have to be sure that we don't move the benchmark. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm slowing down right here, but I need you to hear me. we got to be real sure that we don't move the benchmark. Several years ago, we were clearing some property behind our church. And in the process of clearing that land, one of our cornerstones, one of our landmarks was hit by a machine. And after a while, at the end of the day, we just saw it laying out somewhere in the, in the dirt. So we had to hire a survey company to come and relocate that corner and reset that corner marker. I called them and scheduled the appointment, true to their word, and a few days in, on an early morning, they showed up. I met them out there to show them the corner, but I had no idea that God was going to let me stand there long enough to see something that would leave an indelible mark. I stood there and I watched as they began to locate that where the cornerstone was supposed to be. We have to get back where it should be. Amen. One man was standing a great ways off. And I, he was looking through an instrument. And then another man held what was referred to as a leveling rod or a leveling staff. Each of them had two-way radios and they were talking to one another. Receiving instructions from one another. And so the man that was looking through the main instrument was speaking to the man that I was down there standing beside. And I heard him as he got that, as he got that leveling rod, as he stood there and he just waited for more instructions. And that man, I would hear just a little bit, just a little fuzzy, crisp voice that would come through. And he would say, move it a little bit to the north. And so he moved a little bit to the north. He said, okay, stop right there. Okay, now move it just a little bit. Move it just a little bit to the west. And he moved it just a little bit to the west. And they did this many times until they finally got it right. And then while I was standing there for what seemed like an eternity with no radio, no radio uh, transmissions whatsoever, that man was standing there. The other man can clearly can begin to look through that instrument and I heard him say hold it right there hold it right there amen I want to say this tonight with great deference to any surveyors that may be in the house but here was a man that was standing there with his cap turned around backwards he had holes all ripped in his jeans and I watched him where that corner was supposed to be placed and then he dug a hole and he measured and then he measured again and then he measured again he got off to one side of the original mark and he measured it one way. And then Brother Barrick, he got off the other side of that mark and he measured again the other way. I stood there that morning and I thought to myself, dear God, if this man can be careful, this careful about how he is treating a corner marker, then how much more diligently should I walk to the pulpit the next time? If this man is being this careful with a piece of concrete and a piece of steel that he's putting down in dirt that's one day going to pass away, it won't even be here one day. Hallelujah, Brother Curry. I had to ask myself, if he's going to be that careful with a piece of concrete, then how much more careful should I be when I open the book and say, thus saith the word of God here. Here tonight is my point. Amen. Here is my point. The man who said 
that corner marker that day, he may never, and chances are, he will never revisit that particular longitude and latitude again. But because he was careful and because he was conscientious, because he didn't consider close enough is good enough, amen, he could put his tools away, get in his van, and drive away. And one day the thorns and the thistles are going to grow and the weeds and the trees are going to grow. But he went to bed that night with confidence because he said when another generation comes and they want to find that corner, all they got to do is break out this book. All they got to do is find the longitude and the latitude. And I come tonight to tell you, when they that are afar off walk in our door, if we'll get the longitude and the latitude just right, it won't matter where they come from. It won't matter how deep in sin they've been. It won't matter how addicted to drugs they've been. It won't matter how much alcohol they've consumed. It won't matter how promiscuous their lifestyle has been when they walk in the door of an apostolic church. All they got to do is find the longitude and the latitude because somebody said right here, right there. Don't move it. Just plant it right there. Let's stand across this building. Hallelujah. He slept well that night. He slept well that night because he placed the marker where it was supposed to be. He doesn't need to come back, Brother Varnum. He hasn't called me, Brother Hermes, from that day till now to say, you know, I think we need to come back out and check to make sure. Because he was careful and conscientious. Oh, my God. Spirit in this place. Spirit of God move in this place. Saints, get behind your pastor. Help him stand for this apostolic truth. Amen. That's what's brought us where we are today. Amen. Help your pastor secure and build a sure foundation. Amen. And you'll be forever grateful. Because when the storms of life come, when the storms of life come, you'll know where to go. I know I've shared this story many times in different places. And so if you have heard this before, please forgive me. But I just feel to share a couple of things. I don't want to preach past the moment, but I feel to share this. Several years ago... We were preaching in a church, and after church, we were standing in the foyer. I was standing in the foyer with a pastor. And almost everybody at the church had gone. There were just a few people standing there. And I saw the strangest thing, strange to me at least. I saw a, what looked to be a husband and a wife and two or three children carrying pillows and blankets, and they come marching through the foyer of that church going back into the sanctuary. And I asked the pastor, I said, what, what's going on? And he said, that man lost his job today. And they're going to spend the night in the church in prayer. And they're going to believe God and trust God. My goodness, that moved me. Because those children are now grown adults with children. And when their life falls apart, you know what they're going to be able to say? My daddy didn't go to the bar room. My, my daddy didn't go to the drug dealer. Here's what my daddy did. Here's what my mother did. We got a hold of the horns of the altar. They went to that sure foundation. Amen. On May the 15th of 2015, I received a letter that I still have in my possession from a man who was raised in church and has been back for years. I say this respectfully, but this man is about as far away from God as a human being can get. As a matter of fact, he is in prison right now and has been there a number of years. I, I have no idea where he got the information that he shared that I'm fixing to share with you. But this is what he placed in his letter. He began to talk about some people not in particular, not calling names, but he began to talk about, he said, I, I'm hearing that people are falling away from preaching the apostolic truth.
Now, he wasn't belittling them. I want you to really understand this. As a matter of fact, he spoke with such great sorrow. You could feel the weight of his words in his letter. He spoke with great sorrow about their decision to lift the anchor and drift away from what he had known. I want to remind you, this man by his own admission was as far away from God as he could possibly get. And then he included these following lines in his letter. He, suppo he said, I suppose what I'm looking for today is just some reassurance that you are not going to stop preaching what you have always preached. He said, you're probably wondering how could this possibly matter to me because his words, I'm as far away from God as a man could ever be. And I know that I've always lived wild and I've always done wrong. But I would hate to think that the church I was raised in would not be there when I get ready to come back home. <laughs> we have a mandate upon us, church. We have a mandate upon us. People are watching and they're hoping we don't change. They're hoping we hold on. Hallelujah. Amen. I wonder how many tonight others there are that have not taken the time to write a letter. They've not taken the time to pen any words. They've not taken the time to contact us. But they're watching from afar and they're saying, I sure hope they stay on that foundation. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. I don't know what you want to do or how you want to respond. And we're going to certainly leave this up to everyone tonight. But I, if you choose to make an altar where you are, so be it. But if you choose to step out, we're going to carefully do that and, and do our best to, to follow some guidelines here. But I, I believe there is a spirit of the Holy Ghost that's weighing in on us. Amen. A spirit of the presence of God that is touching us. Would you lift your hands across this building? Let's stand on a sure foundation. Let's stand on a sure foundation tonight. Would you open your mouth? Can we lift our voices? Amen. We were singing loud while ago. Let's pray loud now. Amen. We were worshiping loud earlier in the service. Let's pray loud. Let's intercede loud now. In the name of the Lord. In the name of Take me back. 
so far from you, Lord. But still I hear you calling me. The simple things that I once knew. The memories are drawing me. I must confess. Yet my soul's not satisfied yet. Renew my faith, God. Restore my joy and dry my weeping eyes. Take me back, say. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord. Take me back, dear Lord. To the i 